over the last couple of lectures, we were um, able to develop solutions for plane waves. Um, and we're going to spend the next several lectures looking at many properties of plane waves. And to, in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what happens when plane waves propagate in materials with loss. <clears throat> Up until now, we've assumed that the materials were completely lossless, so that the wave number beta was omega squared mu epsilon, um, epsilon and mu being completely real. But when there's loss, and there's conductivity or other sources of loss, the nature of the wave propagation changes. The objectives from today's lecture are three. Um, first is to determine, um, is to figure out how loss comes into the governing equations of electromagnetics, into Maxwell's equations and into the wave equation. And you need to understand where the loss mechanisms show up in the mathematics. You need to understand what effects this causes on plane wave propagation. And so you need to be able to analyze wave propagation and loss of materials and look at how the wave attenuates as it propagates through the material. And finally, you want to understand two specific cases that are very important in electrical engineering. One is the case of a good dielectric, and the other is the case of a good conductor. And the, there are no perfect dielectrics, completely lossless dielectrics, and there are no perfect electrical conductors. Um, but there are many materials which come close to approximating them under particular sets of circumstances. And we need to be able to apply the rules for these two limits and understand when they're valid and be able to analyze more complicated problems by using these approximations. So let's talk about what happens in a lossy material. Up until now, we've only considered Maxwell's equations in lossless materials. Um, but real materials have many different loss mechanisms. When we apply an electric field, as we see here, we get um, an induced current and an induced polarization. So our induced current is of the form sigma E in our simple materials case. And our induced polarization is chi times E. And this is noted here. The polarization is, of course, separation of charge, um, but the charge is still bound. So the negative electrons are still bound to the positive centers. But in a material with conductivity, there's some number of free carriers. And in the presence of an electric field, those electrons are free to move. They'll bounce off of things and then stop and then move and then bounce off. But there'll be some net conductivity. So these electrons are all moving down, which gives rise to a current flowing in the upward direction. If the fields are time harmonic, so this is at a frequency, all of this is going to oscillate. So these dipoles are going to oscillate up and down, and those oscillating dipoles up and down give rise to what we call the displacement current. Um, there are two main sources of loss in this problem. One source of loss is the, these electrons, when these electrons have collisions with either other electrons or with, other, with the positive charged uh, atomic centers, that converts some kinetic energy into heat, and that's loss. There's also loss associated with an oscillating dipole. Um, due to restoring forces and collisions that happen within the molecules. And so all these loss mechanisms can end up coming into play. Now if we take a look at the time harmonic Maxwell's equation, we had that the curl of H was equal to the current density plus J omega D, and we recall that this J omega corresponded to the time derivative. But we can write the current density as sigma E, and we can write the displacement vector as epsilon E. So del cross E is equal to the sum of these two terms, and I can group the coefficients up front, so I have sigma plus j omega epsilon times E. Now, in the source-free case, we said del cross H equals j omega epsilon E. And up here in this expression, we have something that looks very much like that. Right? So we've got the del cross H equals something times E. If I could take this j omega and factor it out, I would end up with uh, an expression that mathematically looked exactly like the case we had in the source in the source free problem. And so we do that and we can define a complex dielectric constant epsilon complex when I factor out this j omega. Right, so I take this j omega out front, I'm going to end up with sigma over j omega plus epsilon. The j was in the denominator so I bring it up to the numerator and that's where the minus sign comes from. So this is my complex epsilon and with that complex epsilon Ampere's law now becomes del cross H equals J omega times epsilon complex times E. It's got exactly the same mathematical form as the source-free case, um, even though we have currents flowing. Uh, and 
by the way, um, we are here saying epsilon is primarily real, but epsilon in and of itself can have a real and imaginary part as well, because there are loss mechanisms associated with the movement of the bound charges. Um, it, in the macroscopic classical sense, you can't distinguish these loss mechanisms, so any complex portion of the permittivity gets added to the complex conductivity, the complex permittivity like term that comes from the conductivity, and we just lump them all together. So we have this complex permittivity, and all it is is just a complex number that shows up in Maxwell's equation, so it has no impact on the form of the solutions except um, several of the constants now become complex. So gamma, which is now the propagation constant, is alpha plus j beta, or j omega square root mu epsilon complex. When epsilon is purely real, Okay, so if epsilon complex is purely real, the conductivity is zero, then this right-hand side is purely imaginary. Alpha would be equal to zero. If this is real, this is purely imaginary. Alpha is equal to zero, and gamma equals j beta, which is exactly what we saw previously. Right? But in the general case, I have this complex epsilon, which is going to have a real and imaginary part, so this term over here on the right is going to have a real and imaginary part. The solutions to the one-dimensional Helmholtz equation, in this case, become a little bit more complex. I've got e plus and e minus, e to the minus gamma z and e to the plus gamma z. And of course, that's e to the minus alpha z, e to the minus j beta z for the wave propagating to the right, and e to the minus e, e negative, so this is the leftward propagating wave, e to the plus alpha z, e to the plus j beta z for the wave propagating to the left. Now you'll notice how we've chosen these signs. For the wave propagating to the right, the envelope decays exponentially, as we see here, and the wave is propagating this way. For the wave propagating to the left, the envelope is growing as we move to the right, but the wave is propagating to the left, so its amplitude is falling off. The, conduct, the uh, wavelength is associated with beta, the loss, the decay, is associated with alpha. And you can see in both cases we have the wave sort of moving along. And just as the permittivity was complex, which gave rise to a pro complex propagation constant, um, we also have a complex wave impedance, which is j omega mu over sigma plus j omega epsilon. Right. Or, more specifically, it's mu over epsilon complex, and I took the j omega out of the denominator and multiplied top and bottom by it. So this is our expression for the wave impedance. When the material is completely real, um, I have uh, mu over epsilon, and there should be a square root in front of this entire quantity. As we see here. There's a special property that you should be familiar with, you should have heard, uh, you will hear if you go into RF or microwave engineering, that's called a loss tangent. Um, loss tangent describes the loss in the material and it's related to the complex dielectric constant. This complex dielectric constant includes effects of both conduction current from the conductivity and displacement current from the permittivity. Um, and of course, as I indicated, epsilon can actually have an imaginary part, but this imaginary part gets lumped in with the conductivity. Um, and so it's impossible to distinguish those loss mechanisms in the, in the classical case, and they get lumped together. But when you see epsilon prime, that means we're referring to the real part of epsilon. And when you see epsilon double prime, it generally means we're referring to the combination of these two terms. The loss tangent um, describes the angle that's made by the complex permittivity uh, in the complex plane. And so the loss tangent is if I plot the imaginary part and the real part, and you'll notice that the imaginary part of the complex permittivity is negative because of the conventions that we've chosen. If I have a good dielectric, I get a very small angle here because the real part dominates over the imaginary part. And as we'll see later on, um, in actuality, this angle is even smaller than is indicated on this plot. And I have a small angle and therefore a small loss tangent. And so loss tangent is usually used to describe good dielectrics. I can also have a good conductor. In a good conductor, um, the, the permittivity is much, much less than sigma over omega. Right? And the effects of conduction dominate. And in that case, the angle is close to 90 degrees. We typically don't use loss tangent to describe these types of materials. We actually use their conductivity to describe them.
So let's talk quickly about propagation in a good dielectric. The assumption for a good dielectric is that the loss tangent is less than about 0.1. Um, typical numbers are um, 0.01 to 0.001, although there are materials that are even uh, less lossy than that. Um, the real part of the complex permittivity is much greater than the imaginary part of the conductivity, or equivalently, sigma over omega epsilon is much, much less than 1. So when we write out the propagation constant, I get the square root of mu epsilon complex, I can use the Taylor series to expand this term. Out front, we see j omega square root mu epsilon. Well, that's just the original beta naught. That would be the beta in the lossless case. Um, but then that's modified by this term here, which has the square root. But we can use the Taylor series assumption, the Taylor series uh, approximation of that, and that gives us this term here. So this square root of 1 minus j sigma over omega epsilon um, is approximately equal to these two terms here. So there's a, this is the Taylor series where, excuse me, these two terms are approximately equal to each other. And that's where this approximate equal comes from. We said that sigma over omega epsilon was much, much less than 1, so we can ignore the effects of that term compared with that 1. And gamma has this form, which allows us to write uh, that the attenuation coefficient is approximately given by this, and the phase constant is approximately omega square root of epsilon. And here are some loss tangents associated with some dielectrics. Um, so FR4, oil, Pyrex, these are all good dielectrics. They have loss tangents of less than one part in 100. Um, just, uh, the distilled water is not such a great dielectric at 300 megahertz. It's got a loss tangent, as you can see, of uh, um, greater than 0.1. So this assumption is not really... Um, valid. Water becomes a good dielectric as you go higher and higher in frequency, um, but at these lower frequencies, water is actually not that great a dielectric. When you have salt water, seawater, you have conductivity, significant amounts of conductivity, and um, the losses get even higher. Now, the other extreme is a good conductor. In a good conductor, we assume the opposite. We assume that the imaginary part of the complex permittivity is much, much greater than the real part, or equivalently, sigma over omega epsilon is much, much greater than 1. And in this case, when we write the propagation constant, we end up with this expression once again, and the imaginary part dominates, so we can basically ignore this 1, and I take the square root of sigma over omega epsilon times minus j. But minus j, minus j here, well, that's just e to the minus j pi over 2. And I can take that square root, it gives me e to the minus j pi over 4. Something I know from my complex numbers class, as I indicated here. And my propagation constant has this form. And I can write e to the j pi over 4 as cosine pi over 4 plus j sine pi over 4. Uh, I end up with alpha and beta having these uh, terms associated with them. Okay. Notice that the loss and the phase constant are approximately equal to each other uh, in this case. And so what ends up happening is you'll have a wave that comes into an interface, and this wave has a very long wavelength. And this is not drawn to scale. That wave is oscillating sinusoidally. So for many, many, many cycles, it's oscillating sinusoidally, and then it gets to the material. And instead of being reflected right at the surface, which is what would happen if I had a perfect electrical conductor, the wave actually penetrates a small distance inside the material. Right? And this small distance of penetration we call the skin depth. Right? That's the distance into the material that the wave propagates. And so the skin depth is the inverse of the attenuation constant. Um, so it's the square root of 2 over omega mu sigma. As the frequency increases, the skin depth will get smaller as frequency increases. Right? As the conductivity increases, alpha will get larger, so the skin depth will get smaller. And it turns out that the skin depth is also related to the permeability. The thing to take away is that this is not drawn to scale. 
um, at microwave type frequencies where the wavelength is on the order of a few centimeters or perhaps a meter, the skin depth is typically on the order of a few microns. And so the wavelength inside the metal is actually about a millionth of the wavelength outside the metal, which means that the wave speed is much, much slower inside the metal as well. Okay, so that brings us to an end of this lecture. Um, there are few things that we look at in the tutorial, several different problems. We look at the effects of loss on the relationship between the electric and the magnetic field. When, what does the meaning of a complex wave impedance, what does that mean? Um, we determine the propagation characteristics in different types of materials. We try to identify under particular limits and at particular frequencies is uh, uh, water a good uh, for what range of frequencies is water a good dielectric and for what range of frequencies is water a good conductor and we explore the effects of skin depth specifically in terms of the resistance of elements that you might see in a transmission line or in a waveguide